Hi, how are you doing? Cities of. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Uh, if my uh, technical mm. assistant would very kindly uh, mute everybody except Michael and I. You need to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. You need no, to unmute I've unmuted yourself. myself. Okay. And is Michael unmuted? Not yet. Yes. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, lovely to see terrific crowd here tonight uh, to hear from Michael. Um, as somebody who has uh, retired relatively recently, as I have, I um, realised that what you really want to do if you're going to retire is get a feature about your retirement in the Times. And Michael's retirement was actually reported in the Times, unlike mine, which uh, I still don't understand. Michael Kaplan, QC, leading criminal lawyer at Kingsley Napoli for four decades, bailed out this week. This was 2016, but remains a consultant. It says here, Michael, that you're notorious. Oh, no. Kaplan is notoriously discreet, but he's known for acting for General Penichet in the dictator's fight against extradition from the UK. And he was many, involved in many other famous cases. Uh, in, and people at his retirement party included the McCanns, Harvey Proctor, and it says here in inverted commas, a member of the royal family. And uh, amongst the other talents of Michael that it reports in the Times is that Michael is a qualified football referee. And I think we're going to find out a little bit more about that later on. But uh, Michael, are you there? Or am I just I talking am, to myself? Yeah. Excellent. So good evening, my lovely... As with, as with all these talks, I'd just like to start out with a little bit of personal background from somebody, where they grew up and how they proceeded to the career that they went on. So, Michael, where did you start out? Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. Well, I was born and brought up in South London, born in Ballon, then the family moved to Streatham. Um, I really was brought up in a traditional rather than a religious uh, household. My parents were always involved in the local synagogue. I went to the local grammar school, which turned comprehensive whilst I was there. I never really regarded myself as a person um, who was an academic, but I found a way to pass exams. I was fortunate for some extraordinary reason to be made the school captain, which opened the door to an appearance on the David Frost programme Ah. with a chap called Geoffrey Archer. Uh, but I was always, uh, my heart was in sport. I wasn't terribly good at it. And that's why I took up football refereeing. But I was particularly interested in writing about sport. Um, I found actually that a distant cousin of my father's was a world boxing champion in the 1920s in America. Interestingly, his name was spelt with a K ours is spelt with a C, and I wondered whether our uh, spelling of the name was incorrect, but in fact, it, it is correct, we found uh, later on. Now, I started writing, and I sent an article to the BBC, and found myself at the age of 16 doing a piece for the BBC uh, in their radio um, sports report one day, which was obviously fascinating and very nice, up at Broadcasting House. Um, I decided then that really I'd like to become a sports journalist and sent my articles to ITV. And uh, I was granted an interview with Jimmy Hill and a chap called John Bromley, who was yeah. the head of ITV Sport. And they were very good. This was the time I was doing the A-levels, you know, at the time when you did do examinations. And, and, and you I, were at school. And I was at school, yes. Um, and they were very kind and very friendly and said, look, the best thing is we could offer you a job now, but why don't you go to university and complete your education? We'll keep in touch uh, and we'll see what happens when you leave university. And indeed, they were very good. They kept in touch. And when it came to the 1972 Olympics, I received a letter from them. Could I come in and be part of the team? Obviously in a very low position, but... That for me was just being there was, it was a great thing. It was doing it from London. And my job, uh, one of them was to look at the tape machines as it was churning out the information, including sadly, of course, about the Munich 
massacre. Huh. Uh, and one day, actually, whilst I was there, I couldn't get the Associated Press machine working. And so I had to call Associated Press along. And to my embarrassment, I hadn't actually turned it on at the mains. Uh, but they were very good about all of this and uh, did in fact later write as some people will know about the Munich Olympics and about the massacre. But my view was they should have cancelled the game, but games, but who am I to say that? But then um, I went back to university, of course, carried on, and they invited me to join the team for the 1976, uh, 1974, I think, um, a, a, um, World Cup, which again was being run by London Weekend Television. And um, they're again very kind. And one of my jobs there, because we didn't have technology as you have it now, is to um, look at the times goals were scored with a stopwatch, sitting next to a chap called Martin Tyler, who you'll know for many years has been the chief football correspondent and commentator for Sky. And one of the other things actually I did there was it, they decided groundbreaking um, things they were going to do was to have people to phone in. Uh, to one day. It had never been done before, but they didn't know whether anyone would phone in. So when we were rehearsing it in the morning, they were going to do it. They got me to sit in a studio upstairs somewhere and phone in in the afternoon. So I suppose one of my claims to fame is being one of the first people to phone a question into. <laughs> um, but in reality, I, I went through university. Uh, it was quite clear that it was probably better following a trade as a solicitor. Um, again, had difficulties with my examinations, didn't find it easy, but got, uh, as we call them, articles in the training contract with a firm in the West End, a small firm, uh, being paid £20 a week. And really, I thought I would probably specialise in litigation or employment law. But this firm also did criminal law and liquor licensing and gaming. And I found an attraction to that type of um, law. Um, and really went through my articles. Um, I'd met Jane through FZY. Uh, we were getting married. We wanted to move to a young, upcoming, rising Jewish community and came to Belmont. And I must say, we're ever so grateful for all the uh, wonderful relationships we've made with friends here and the kindness, which is also always shown to us and our children. That's not meant in any way to have an easy run this evening. <laughs> and um, we, we stayed in the community and I, um, the attraction perhaps of being newly married, not much money, was attracted by the very much more uh, salary that there was for those who did conveyancing and therefore moved to a firm which dealt with conveyancing. I realised straight away that was not for me and Jane would tell you it was terrible. Uh, and there's no point in going to work every day. It doesn't matter how much money they pay you if it's not interesting. And so Michael, I can I clarify, yeah. was it the absence of liquor and gaming that you found disappointing or, or what? Well, those who know me know that I neither drink or game, but um, <laughs> it, it, it was really being in court and dealing with real people in difficult circumstances, I think, and having to make up decisions and give advice immediately. And that's the one thing people don't realise often, that when you're doing criminal law, unlike perhaps conveyancing or even civil litigation, you have to advise immediately. And when people tell me now about advocacy, I say the most important piece of advocacy in a criminal case is what the solicitor does at the police station. That will shape the whole case in the, in the future. But just carrying on um, with my development, if you like, I managed to get a job at Kingsley Napley. In fact, one of the partners I'd been in court doing a case with, one never knows these doors open and stay there really for 30 years um, as it were, doing criminal law, all kinds of criminal law, and took a particular interest in international criminal law. But one of the reasons for that was that it was a bit of a backwater. No one else wanted to do it, and it was very interesting. And, of course, over the time, I've um, done work in all kinds of um, criminal cases. Um, fortunately, I've been asked to sit as a, a recorder in the Crown Court, and then I was appointed Queen's Counsel, the Times reporting that I was the first from a criminal background to uh, take silk. But I should tell you that it came as a great surprise. There wasn't very many solicitors I could speak to about it. But I knew I had to get all this fancy dress to go and be sworn in, uh, including 80 denier tights. Now, I really don't know even now how on earth you get the seam 
around the back of the tights, absolutely straight. And I should tell you that I got all my kit from a legal uh, outsource, obviously, but I know one of my colleagues went with his wife, I think it was to Phoenix, and she got these 80 tenier, tenier tights and the um, assistant looked rather amused at this. And she said, don't worry, they're not for me, they're for him. <laughs> uh, um, but it, it really was um, having to dress up um, and, and the one advice, one bit of advice I have to say, everyone told me who was a QC was before you put all this garb on, make sure you go to the loo first because you'll never be able to go after you put it all on. Anyway, I mean, that, that was a great uh, source of um, excitement, really. But over the years, of course, I've had some wonderful cases, met wonderful people, done things which obviously gone wrong, things have gone right. And I've really, um, I suppose, seen the whole gamut of the criminal law, um, dealt with cases from terrorism, murder, um, through to serious sex cases, uh, assault, and most importantly to many people, had to advise those who have had fines for parking illegally. And believe me, that's the most emotional uh, effect <laughs> that can possibly be. And I'm afraid that I'm in the doghouse because Jane always reminds me that the last parking ticket she got, I said, you'll have to pay. There's no defence uh, to it. But of course, tonight, I'm really and only talking about the role of the solicitor in the criminal in criminal cases. And I suppose I've seen the whole of the criminal justice system in one way or another. I've prosecuted the CPS. I've sat as a judge now and also, like you, David, sat on a jury at the Old Bailey. But as I say, I face the music tonight to try to defend the position of the defendants. I think one of the most surprising things you've said, Michael, in that introduction, apart from the fact that you wanted to be a sports journalist, and I reckon at least half the people on the call here would love to hear more about sports than the law, but we'll set that aside, is look at, from taking from 2020, the notion of international criminal law as a backwater when the British courts, are, English courts, are stashed full of international uh, litigation is probably a little bit surprising. But let's just start at the beginning. As her, Julia mentioned, she would like everybody hung. What she didn't make quite clear at the beginning was, that, did they have to be accused of a crime or she just wanted everybody hung anyway? But let's start with the absolute basic point uh, about the principle in a democratic legal system that ev everybody is entitled to a defence. Could you expand on your perspective on that, Michael? Well, you're absolutely right. The rule of law includes everyone is entitled to be represented and to, ha and, and to have someone represent their interests. And the defence lawyer who is representing someone is not there to judge them, is not there to decide whether they've told the truth or not, is not there to morally decide whatever they've done is right or wrong. There's other people who do that in the system and they're called judges and juries. We're there to represent them and their interests. Now, obviously, um, we're treated with a great deal of disdain, um, abused at times, told, as I have done been on, on occasions, if you represent these type of people, then you're as bad as they are. And a member of the shul told me that. Now, I understand that view, especially if you um, know someone who has been uh, the victim of crime. But in fact, anyone in the legal system will tell you that the legal system is better off if the defendant is represented properly by a solicitor. And let me just mention one, one case. This is not um, really the reason for, for dealing with this issue, but you mentioned international crime. The Supreme Court made it clear in a, in a judgment that uh, terrorists cannot be aggressively t interrogated, even if that means lives are lost. And it will mean that, 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 that because of the democratic si system, that the countries will be fighting terrorism with one arm behind their back. And it will mean people will go free, but that's the price you pay for living in a democracy. That's the Supreme Court. I'm very tempted to ask people what they agree and then tell them that that's the Supreme Court of Israel which passed that judgment. 
Yeah. But, but I can go on and give examples of the role of a solicitor, for example, at the police station, you know, how you can represent someone before the court, uh, and indeed what your duties are in preparing the case. And that might perhaps help people. Uh, and very happy to answer, and I say face the music at any stage, because the first contact, often someone who is um, suspected of, of committing a crime, is at the police station. And that often happens immediately. And the role of the solicitor is to make sure that his rights are upheld at all times. And some police officers, in my experience, and I'll call upon my experience, obviously, during this evening, are very fair about that. I mean, I remember going to the police station on one occasion uh, for a fraud case, and the police officer said to me, by the way, the police have to give you disclosure of the case against you, not every piece of paper, but sufficient so you know what the allegation is. And one police officer took me to a room and had all laid out and indexed all the case. and said, there you are, Mr. Kaplan, that's what it is. Take your time, have a read of it, and then we'll conduct the interview. And in fact, I complimented him afterwards uh, uh, and because how good he was. And there's no reason for police officers not to cooperate with us. But on other occasions, it goes the other way. I called to the police station to um, advise a young boy who he and his brother in the Irish Troubles had mimicked the IRA and started sending letter bombs to a lot of important people. Um, it was quite clear on talking to him that he had educational problems and the anti-terrorist squad wanted to interview him and they took me into the room and there in the room was a table on one side was two chairs for the two police officers on the other side was a chair for him and I said well, where's the chair for me oh you can sit in the corner over there Mr Kaplan I said no 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 uh, and so we had our first stand-up fight if you like about that which they weren't too happy and so I sat next to him. Of course, it would only go ahead the interview if I was able to do that. And then they started off. And in those days, we didn't have um, recordings. It was all written down. Um, the tape was running, but you wrote down um, the questions. And um, I, I as, as they're calling out the questions, will write them down and actually saying what they were. And there's a reason behind that, because at the end of a day-long interview, you read this back. And if their record is different to yours, as it was then, there's going to be all kinds of problems. But they didn't like this. And they moaned and groaned about it to the point where I said to them, well, let's get all these moans and groans down on the interview and we can let the court decide it. That was my duty. Mind you, I should tell you that he was convicted and got 10 years at the Old Bailey. Uh, and another occasion, if you like, the only the other occasion I'll tell you about is being called uh, police station to advise of actually a senior politician. And the police were suggesting it may have been breach of the Official Secrets Act. And as I walked through into the custody area, the custody sergeant, by the way, is the person who's responsible for all those who are in custody. Their welfare is a responsibility of that man. And as I walked through, one of the officers opened my jacket. I said, what are you doing? So I want to make sure you haven't got a, a tape on or a microphone that you're taping this. I said, all you had to do was ask me. Well, that set the, the scene of what they wanted to do. And they refused to allow my colleague uh, into the interview saying that would impede their investigation. I said, she's entitled to be there. Let's have an argument in front of the custody sergeant and let's look at the code of practice. It's what is called code of practices um, at police stations, which all prisoners are entitled to. If you, want to. if you want to sound you know about criminal law, say you've had to consult code C of the code of practices. Everyone thinks then you know about it. But of course the police officer was wrong. There's no reason for him to be there. And then it goes on to what is disclosure. And they read on a tape, a three paragraph um, disclosure, which told me nothing. And I said, can I have a copy? No, it's on the table. I said, the tape's no good to me. I won't get the tape for months. Now, it doesn't do them any good because when we read a prepared statement, they asked me for a copy of a prepared statement where well, you can imagine what my answer was to them. And, and the whole thing was quite ridiculous. But that's what does happen on both sides. 
I mean, my view of police stations for what it's worth is I always take the view when I was doing that work to try to be cooperative and be conciliatory rather than confrontational. But if you had to be confrontational, then, then you've got to do it. So that really sets the scene at the police station, just moving on. Michael, can I just hold you for a minute there? Having sat in on the jury service recently, which is why I thought about doing this entire series, and sitting there thinking, I am listening to a total load of cob's wallop from the, uh, uh, in regards to the defence case. Uh, and I was very surprised in the pre-interview at a couple of things that you told me. Are you permitted to lie or support a lie? And what do you do if you know that your client is telling a porky? That was a whole big range of issues, but you explored them with me. And I was very interested to hear the reality of the law in this matter. The reality is, no, you're not. You are bound by what your client tells you, however implausible it may be, and you can test it with him. Those are your instructions. And that's what you have to do. Now, um, there are there's never black and white situations. Um, if your client uh, in the interview says something which is contradicting what he's told you as his instructions, then you will have to withdraw. And I've had that situation where you stop the interview or at a reasonable time. Again, you've got to be careful because you can't say to the police officers, my client's lying. But at the first um, juncture when it can be stopped, you'll talk to your client and you explain to them, as I have done in the past, uh, for professional reasons, I can't carry on if you maintain that position. But your choice is to either tell the truth, tell them the position, or I will withdraw. And I've had situations where I've had to withdraw and the police have tried to find out from me the reasons why I have professionally have withdrawn. Of course, I can't tell them. Now, it's fair to say it's never as black and white as that. And of course, it's fair to say when you're in a police station, you've got to make up decisions very quickly and you've got to do them with the best um, position as you can on what you know at that time. And it happens in court as well. Um, someone for perfectly understandable reasons sometimes. Um, they want to embellish their story in the witness box, say something which <laughs> they didn't say to you as part of their instructions. And you may be professionally embarrassed. And professionally, if you can't continue to act, you can't continue to act. And that, that's the position. But there's no reason why you shouldn't act for anyone, whatever his instructions are to you, um, providing that he maintains that position. And it may be just the last point on this, David, it may well be that because of what he says are his instructions, you've got to take a decision, you've got to advise him. It might be best if he doesn't answer any questions. Now, years ago, it was much easier because you couldn't have what is called the adverse inference that could be drawn against him if he didn't mention something which he later relies on in court. You all heard the bill and all those with the actual caution. Um, but now it, it is slightly different. And Again, you have to advise him. You have to advise him of the pros and cons. I mean, I, again, I've been in interviews where I've seen someone in the cells, and often it's for the first time, and you have to advise them uh, what to say or not to say in, in the sense of whether they're going to answer questions. And they may take your advice, they may not. And I, I mean, we'll probably get on to the Pinochet case in due course. But um, when I saw him for the first time, which was on a Sunday afternoon, never seen him before, and I like to get to know clients a little bit so they have confidence in the advice I shall give. I had to tell him, look, the police are outside. They want to serve on you an extradition warrant. My very firm advice to you is do not answer anything. Do not say anything at all. I mean, I didn't know whether he wanted to make a political statement. And indeed, he, he was very good. He, he didn't say anything. And as my colleague said to me as we walked out that evening, he said, what do you think happened to the last person who told him not to answer? <laughs> so you stay with me throughout. Uh, in that context, given that you're in cells, you've been in with people accused of terrorism, innocent bunnies that they were, and murderers and the like, have you ever been threatened? Uh, we'll talk about social media in a while, but been threatened physically or felt threatened? Or like, am I going to get out of this one in one piece? Have you ever been in that situation, Michael? No, I haven't. I, I don't think I have. Um, obviously, I've been with people who have become very emotional 
some people who really cannot understand why they're there and um, it's all unfair and others who want to discuss the case with you and strangely those who are for example accused of murder or terrorist offences normally realise the seriousness of their position and want to discuss the case with you and I'm talking here about pretty vicious uh, offences. Uh, by the way, I hope you've not just had your supper, by the way, when we go through some of these in due course. <laughs> um, but some of them are, and, and you know, I'm shown disclosure and I have to go through that with them. It's my duty to do that and to advise them on it. Uh, um, but I've never felt um, threatened. I have decided on times, as I've said before, to withdraw from a case because professionally it would be wrong of me to continue on in that case but again you can't take that decision lightly and you might be criticized later on yeah the word disclosure um covers and it's a nice neutral word to cover the fact presumably that that means you that you're looking at photographs of murder victims some pretty horrific stuff i would assume yes yes yeah and, and um as i say it's ex certificate stuff some of it if not beyond that but again, you, you, you've, you've got to really, I think, disassociate yourself from that. You have a professional responsibility, professional duty. And what I'd say to you and to everyone is, um, look, obviously, um, you'll treat criminal defence lawyers with um, contempt at times. And I fully understand the reasons for that when you see what happens. But how would you feel if you or someone you knew found themselves sadly or unfortunately those circumstances wouldn't you want their advisor to advise them fully and look at all the information before them before we get on to uh pinochet and some of your other uh cuddly clients uh, let's um let's take a case that you had nothing to do with which really poses i think the moral challenge and you and I talked about it a little bit before, which is the Eichmann case. And just give us the strict law on what happened there uh, in, uh, in the context of what we will then be talking about. Well, look, Adolf Eichmann, as we know, um, managed to escape and was tracked down to Argentina. And he was one of the architects of the Holocaust. And I'm sure, let me make it absolutely clear, despite what I'm going to say, I'm sure everyone here would agree that it was absolutely right that he should face the death penalty. But let's try to look at it in a slightly unemotional way, as indeed lawyers have to. Uh, he'd gone to Argentina, he was tracked down by Mossad. Israel had an extradition treaty with Argentina at the time, it's the early 60s now, I think it was. 61. Uh, uh, and uh, Israel decided that uh, they couldn't trust the extradition arrangements with Argentina. And therefore, he um, was taken. Um, he was actually assaulted. Uh, they decided it was Eichmann. And he was taken on an El Al plane without the consent of the Argentinian authority. They didn't know about it. In other words, he was kidnapped and taken back to um, Israel. Now, there's no question he was kidnapped. And interestingly, kidnapping is now an international crime, which can be tried anywhere. Uh, and there was um, a right hue and cry between Argentina and Israel at the time. He was then placed on, on trial um, for offences connected with the Holocaust uh, and um, commences with offences against humanity, I think it was, and offences against the Jewish people. Now, again, everyone will say perfectly proper. Um, look what he did. But just pause for a second. That all those took place up until 1944-45. At that time, Israel was not a country. It wasn't in, hadn't started to become a country until, what, 1947-46-47. And so they sought to try him for offences which occurred before the state of Israel was in being, and actually for offences for which in his own country were not an offence at the time, however terrible that sounds, but that's the realistic position. 
Now, you may think right up until now, well, what I'm saying is, how on earth could they try him for these offences? Now, interestingly, um, what came out of that case is whether there is what is known as universal jurisdiction. What that really means, oversimplifying it, is some offences are so heinous as to merit, so heinous that they can be tried anywhere in the world. And it's one of the things which came up in the Pinochet case. And whatever criticism there may be of the Eichmann trial, of course, one of the offences, and this is just me saying this, was against the Jewish people. And Israel, I think, legitimately were able to say that they were the guardian of the Jewish people and therefore were permitted uh, to try him on this. But it's not as simple as that either, because on my reading the case, I'm not sure he was given the full disclosure of the case against him. Um, and uh, and um, I'm not sure, I think, I think in fact, David, that Israel changed the constitution so that non-Israeli lawyers could represent him. But this what grew out of this case was this possible um, international criteria of universal jurisdiction. And you probably all think, as, as you do, and as I do, well, that's pretty good, really. There must be some offences so heinous, so bad, that they can be tried by any country. Yes, but just think of the international chaos with that particular uh, principle. And there are countries which have tried to enforce that. And it's one of the issues which came up in the Pinochet case, which we're I'm sure will come to later. Um, and therefore, do I think it was a right decision? Well, I think it can be justified, but um, I think it would have been far better if he would have been tried in an international court. We didn't have the International Criminal Court then. It didn't come into being until 2020. My views on the International Court are well known. I've written about it in a number of articles in the Times. I'm a great supporter of the International Criminal Court. I think that's the way forward. And in my view, it's far better than what we have is these sort of plethora of ad hoc tribunals um, which come up, um, such as the one for Yugoslavia and all those type of things, because all they are really uh, sensible as they may be, is victor's justice. And who's going to set the parameters of them? But that's another rather contentious argument as well. Indeed, and many people would say that the Nuremberg trials uh, were in a sense victor's justice. And if the Germans had won, they'd have done the same to whoever, to the British leadership at the time. I was going to come on to the International Criminal Court, and I may revert to that in the end. But uh, let us deal with perhaps one of your more notorious uh, clients, Although, from your from readings of you, Michael, it looks like you had a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Let's start with Pinochet. Can you just give us a quick background? He'd been uh, uh, he had been leader of his country. He had reputedly ordered the murder of many people. I'm not sure that he'd actually murdered anybody himself, um, and he managed to get over here, and it was a hugely famous international situation. So what was he actually being tried for? I mean, I forget now. What were, what was actually going on? Yeah. And what were you trying to do? Now, let me just run through it, hopefully very, very quickly, because so people understand the Pinochet case and, and how, in a sense, it fits in. Um, he come over because they had trouble with his back and he was being treated at the London Clinic. And um, Spain, um, decided to issue an, an, an arrest warrant, or we'll European arrest warrant, EAW as we called them then, European arrest war warrant, for, um, for him to be extradited from this country to Spain, really on the back of the human rights groups who found out he was here and sought his extradition. Um, I came into this the weekend when he, he, I didn't know he was here, never heard, well, vaguely heard of him. I thought Chile, you know, I'm sure like you, was this long thing country on the other side of the Andes, many miles away, probably a second division country, didn't know anything more than that. Is that um, your football refereeing taking a judgment of that? <laughs> I, I think we, we were in the World Cup, weren't we, in, in Chile, but uh, didn't do terribly well. <laughs> right, and again, I mean, it's a very contentious person. We had to decide very quickly, do we take the case on? I mean, Breach of human rights. I think it was maybe thirty thousand people had, had died. 
but we took the view we're lawyers, we, he's entitled to be represented. So Spain were applying for his extradition for offences which occurred in Chile. Um, certainly a game running through, when I first saw the uh, arrest warrant game on that Sunday, um, because that, that's what holds him pending extradition. The Home Secretary then in those days had to give the go ahead. Jack Straw, Home Secretary, had to give the go ahead and then you have the extradition proceedings. But people would have heard a lot about European arrest warrants. They're, they're quite straightforward, really. The whole purpose is because we trust our European neighbours, or certainly did then, we realise we don't now. Um, that uh, it's really more a transfer of prisoner from one place to another. And um, the, the, there was something odd about the wording of it, actually. <laughs> um, and they served this warrant. Um, and we decided to challenge this really on two bases. Firstly, the warrant, I don't think, disclosed actually a criminal offence. They got it wrong. Secondly, he may have been entitled to diplomatic immunity. But in any event, when I mentioned about universal jurisdiction earlier, as a head of state, he had immunity from prosecution. Now, um, we, we issued proceedings. Frankly, I didn't really want to issue proceedings, hoping the Home Office would agree that they got it wrong or let's do some kind of deal moving forward. But the Home Office we didn't respond to my correspondence. Um, and then we didn't have the internet um, or emails. And so we had to go to court and we won in the high court. And that then went to the, um, went to the House of Lords, uh, which was the highest court in the land. Uh, then the law lords sat in a committee room. Uh, um, and 10 days later, normally the process takes six to nine months, we were in the House of Lords. And the House of Lords, um, gave their judgment one day in the House of Lords. You can't have television cameras in the court, but in fact, the House of Lords, when they give their decision, is in the chamber, which is televised. So Channel 4, I think it was, had put a scoreboard out um, behind, outside, and there were five law lords, and we went 2 nil up, and then it got to 2-2. Two, two. Um, and then Lord Hoffman um, gave his decision, which we lost 3-2. But one of the parties which had applied to what we call intervene in the proceedings was amnesty. Now, inter intervening in it means a party wants to come in and argue it. And you could well understand why our amnesty wanted to do that. Here they saw an opportunity, the real tyrant, that they could show that um, tyrants could not hide behind immunity. And here... Um, the House of Lords had decided that, yes, he could he could go before the courts for them to decide whether he should be extradited. But funny enough, that evening, information got to me that Mrs. Hoffman was involved in one of the amnesty companies. Uh, um, and then there was um, an, uh, uh, an anonymous call to, to my office, someone who... Um, said that Lord Hoffman was involved in one of the companies. And I did write to um, Amnesty's lawyers to inquire about the position. And the letter I got back was the most vitriolic letter I have ever had actually from a firm of lawyers saying, how dare I challenge the, the, the impeccability of one of the law lords um, and they leaked the correspondence. I say they, it could be only, only them. And I must say, um, the vitriol there was directed at me. How could I stoop so low then? And of course, it's all very well when you do that. But when it goes wrong, I'm afraid it rather blows up in your face. And um, we, we decided when I did get information confirmed that he was a director of the company that we had to challenge this in the House of Lords, never been done before. Um, and the, the BBC had uh, reported their legal correspondent, Joshua Rosenberg, who I'm sure many of you know, and I know very well. And I, I always um, tweet his, him when I see him. Um, we, we keep in touch very often about things that he went on television to say this could never be done. Um, funny enough, he, he was following this for the BBC with, um, two reporters, one was Daniel Sanford, who's now the Home Affairs correspondent, and a young radio reporter called Fergus Walsh, who of course now is the medical editor of the BBC. Um, but in those hearings, and I mean, we were being, um, should we say, there was, there was aggression 
uh, naked aggression against us by the CPS who act on behalf of the country, act on behalf of Spain, um, saying, how on earth could you do this? And one of the law lords, a chap called Lord Goff, who was um, a, a six foot four, but a gentle giant, never forget, just suddenly turned around and, and said, what did this look like to the ordinary person sitting at the back of the court? And then it, it just fell away completely. So they had to have a rehearing. And uh, the rehearing took place before seven uh, judges. Now, you may think that's great, but I can tell you the problem then is that when you get their judgment, you can't quite work out who's agreed to what and who said what. But the, the CPS, for some extraordinary reason, and I've asked them since, I don't know why they did it, decided to, rather than leave it as general conduct against him, actually try to specify 31 charges against him. Now, you need to know... Sorry, Mike, just for clarification, we're talking about charges against Pinochet, not yeah. Lord Hoffman, aren't we? Well, um, may have been against him, but no, it's about, about Pinochet. But you also have to understand there was something called the Torture Convention. It gets a bit complicated, but in essence, what that is, is that Spain, the UK and Chile had signed the Torture Convention, which means that if anyone is responsible for torture, and indeed three of the allegations against Pinochet was torture, um, then they can be tried anywhere. So the way the argument went was, they could be tried um, in this country or they could be tried in Spain. Now, many, many of them were knocked out, but the, these remained. And so the extradition proceedings took place. Um, now, he, we lost the extradition proceedings and we were appealing them. And this must have been January 2020. Now, what then happened? Michael. Sorry, January 2000. I've lost 20 years. January 2000, um, and we were appealing this, um, but we didn't have things, things like the internet. Uh, um, but um, the Home Secretary uh, contacted me to say that we have reason to think that your client might not be very well. And if he's not fit to stand trial, wherever that trial might be, then I can't extradite him. Would you consent, would your client consent to being examined and it will be confidential to you and the home office um i took instructions and our view was we will continue on with the appeal but if you want him uh, examined then we won't stand in your way and in fact the examination took place at northwood park hospital um i didn't we didn't invite him back here for tea by the way on, on the way um, now that that report was that he couldn't he wasn't fit to stand trial um, now that was outraged obviously people like amnesty um, uh, and um, the human rights groups now they went to court they wanted to see this report and believe it or not the report from your doctor isn't necessarily confidential to you uh, that could be trumped if it's in the public interest mm. for it to be disclosed and this was disclosed uh, and in fact leaked all over the place and appeared in all kinds of places um, but uh, eventually the home secretary decided that he couldn't extradite him and off we went um up the up the motorway i think it was to boston for him to be flown out now as a defense lawyer um people will, will know that during the course of this i'd met margaret thatcher she wanted to see me uh, to tell me all the things that Chile had helped us with in relation to the Falkland Islands and how she would be prepared to come out publicly uh, on that matter. Um, and it was a very interesting, obviously, discussion. Um, and she'd given me, or sent round to me, a, a, a gift, a parting gift, which she wanted me to give to him on the plane when he left uh, from on uh, at the airport um now that wasn't the most important thing what well, the most important thing was that if anyone tried to stop him leaving and indeed i knew my intelligence was there was three countries who were going to seek to do that how did it look if he then got on the plane and left for chile so that was really my my main concern so actually i tied to the outside of my bag this gift so i wouldn't forget it um, and there were challenges on the way, but it, I think 
everyone realised the game was up and off he should go. And that was the end of it. In fact, I did get on the plane, and saw him off and gave him this um, package and everyone wanted to say goodbye to me. The trouble was uh, they'd started taxiing up the runway to take off. So I had to quickly get them to stop and let me off the plane. Otherwise I'd have been on my way to the Ascension Islands or somewhere else <laughs> again. Um, but one thing, can I just say this in relation to that before you ask me questions about acting is I did go to Chile. Um, the media knew I was there. Uh, it's not fun being when the media are all over you because you have you know, what watch everything you have to do there were protests outside the hotel uh someone outside my room although the hotel did insist on calling me lord kaplan and felt it'd be discourteous to <laughs> say otherwise to them um, but i did also see the jewish community there one of the peoples I, I called on and it was very interesting because um they clearly were they, who I saw in the um, Maccabi is very strong out there. And they insisted on showing me round the Maccabi stadium with everything there is very impressive. And they said to me, look, whatever the position might be, and when he was in power around about 1973, uh, he came to the main synagogue in Santiago and spoke to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the state of Israel. Can you name me, they said, any other leader who went to the main synagogue in the country to speak in support. Now, of course, I didn't know, but it's quite interesting that there are always pros and cons. And, and I know he did voice to me the concern um, of the suggestion that he perhaps had been involved in treating badly Jewish people. He did have the, the Jewish newspapers there. So we had, did have a chat about that at one stage. Um, now, I don't know the truth of it. I don't know what it is. Um, I was the lawyer. Uh, and I found it very intrusive, and this is one of the problems with these cases, of the media and the politics, and the media was such that wherever I went during the days I was there, the media were following me, and um, actually it, it was pretty dreadful. I mean, on the last afternoon I decided, my last point this, to go and get some gifts for the kids and for Jane. It cost me a fortune because uh, as I walked through this shopping centre, everyone was wanting to shake my hand, people, girls wanted to come and kiss me. Well, perhaps that's quite nice, but, um, and I went into a shop and people wanted to sh you know, shake my hand, thank me. And so I had to take the first thing I could find, which is outrageously expensive and leave quickly. That's part of the- Margaret Thatcher for something for Jane. Uh, <laughs> just for a minute, as you referred to these things, and I'm already, I see that we're already drifting towards the end of the programme, the International Criminal Court in Israel, it's been used deeply politically to go after Israel. On the one hand, you've been a very, con you're, you're a strong advocate, you said, of the International Criminal Court, but it, it is very concerning how it, it, it would appear that it is being used in a deeply political way against Israel. And I just wonder whether you had any reflections on that one. Well, I disagree with that, David. Okay. Uh, I, d I disagree. I'll tell you why. Because neither the US or Israel our signatories have signed up to agree to it. Now, I can well understand the reasons for both of those not wanting to do it. But what's happened is that those countries who are members of the ICC are obviously subject to their jurisdiction. And I know there's been a recent decision quite recently where the Palestinian Authority signed up and the court, one of the chambers of the court, had to decide what was the jurisdiction of um, the, the Palestinian Authority. Now, I think one of the difficulties is when you have any decision like that, any country which thinks it's adverse to them, doesn't like it, is bound to say, well, why are you doing this? Is it anti-Semitic? I, I think the Prime Minister of Israel said it's anti-Semitic. But I think um, if you are going to have a sensible international form of justice and you're going to have those who should be subject to international justice then i think you've got to have an international form you can't have these ad hoc tribunals in my view and therefore i think and i would suggest that, that countries perhaps have, have got to realize you can't take everything there's going to be difficult times but if you want to buy into this idea then i think you've got to um, accede to the responsibility to have that. And, and one of the problems you see, and in fact, I think I wrote about this at the time, I 
Libya, I think it was some years ago, that you had a joint um, uh, uh, airplane um, sorties, as it were, by both America and the UK, soldiers of both. If there were alleged breaches of human rights with that, you'd have this extraordinary situation where the British soldiers would be subject to the ICC, but the American soldiers wouldn't. And I think that's what one of the difficulties. Now, it's not perfect by any means, uh, and I'll be the first to say that, but I think that if you, as I say, if you're going to say, look, there are tyrants who should be brought to book wherever they are, then I think everyone's got to buy into this idea and take walks and all. OK, let's take this in a different direction. Um, the grammar school boy who found exams difficult, went to university and found exams difficult, wants to start out as a sports journalist and ends up on Sky TV in the earlier part of this millennium. How did you end up on the face, not the face of the press, what was it was called, the uh, press preview, uh, <laughs> which were on often, and I've become obsessed with it ever since I have to admit, it's the, I don't watch the news, I only watch the press preview on TV. And you were on that for several years, Michael. How did you get into that position? Was it Jimmy Hill again? <laughs> no, what, what, what really happened was, I suppose I become known as someone who um, knew a bit about international criminal law. A um, bit of a fraud, really, because I'm not sure I know a great deal about it. But it, that Sky, in particular, the BBC, would phone me and I would help them. I would explain the position to them. And they asked um, every self, look, you're very good at doing this. Would you come on um, when we have a story? And yeah, the firm were very interested that I should do this. And I'd written, as I say, a number of articles for the Times as well about this. And so I agreed to do this you've got to remember with television it's immediate you can't say i come along tomorrow or you can't say i come along this afternoon and sky in particular i got to know how it worked that they would have a meeting around eight o'clock in the morning and i was always in the office early and if there's a story you get a call and so i think they knew i was very um carpet if i would try to do that and i the bbc also started to contact me and two programs you never turned down with the BBC, I was told. And that's the Today programme in the morning and the world at one. And what often happened when you went to do those things, if you had time, was you'd come out of the world at one studio at, what, 10 past one, and you'll be nabbed by the, the news channel. Can you come and do something here and, and go and do other things? And I was happy if I had time to do that, really on the basis that uh, the more you do it, the better you come at it. Because what you don't realise, if you go into a remote studio, whilst I can see all of you here, you're just facing a camera. You've no idea what it looks like, no idea what you actually say half the time. Um, and then as they seem to trust me with live programmes, Sky started by saying, look, would you be interested to come and do the newspaper review every so often on a Sunday morning? I thought, that's great. Um, but in fact, it's a bit of a challenge because you'd be picked up at, I suppose, something like half past five in the morning, papers in the car, um, you get at Sky at about 10 past six. Um, and you had to think about three stories you're going to do for 20 to seven, with, within which time they're always keen you went through makeup. Um, they always said to me at makeup, do you want blush or powder? Now, what the hell, how the hell do I know what that difference is? Sorry, um, Michael, be, you're yeah. a man who's worn, worn 80 denier stockings. You should know. I should know. Um, but, but the difference, Sky, that was the newspaper in Sky, but then the BBC, they, they watch all these things. It's not because I was any good at it, it's because they watch who's doing it. And they, they said, would you come and do it? I think it's after the 10.30 news, I did it a few times. So BBC is very different. Um, firstly, as at Sky, they'll offer you porridge and things in the morning if you wanted it, which was never a good idea if you want. The BBC, you're lucky if you get a cup of tea, I can tell you. Um, but they're the editor decided what stories remember you, you the newspapers the first editions of tomorrow's newspaper didn't come through until what 10 o'clock half quarter past 10 you're on at 20 to 11 um and somehow you're supposed to read the front page and then work it out and there was more than one occasion where where the editor had changed the decision as you're actually in the studio whilst they're running the packages be, before you i mean it was it was Interesting, it was exciting. What I did learn is you can't panic. You've just got to make, make out as if you know what you're talking about, even if you don't. Uh, well, talking of appearing in the media, I, I remember one of the things you told me. Um, 
is, is that at the news, the newspapers and the paraprazzi are looking for images, stock images, all the time, and there are consequences for you coming out of the steps of the High Court. Perhaps you could talk that through a bit, Michael. Yeah. Um... Again, I, I realised, I mean, Pinochet wasn't the first case I'd been involved in when, when you had the media, but it never as intense as that. And I knew, uh, indeed, as I say to clients, if the media are there, the pictures thereafter are those which are out of the ordinary. If you walk in motionless, um, showing no emotion at all, that's what you need to happen. And I mean, I had to remind the legal team often as we came out of places, out of court, that um, you must show no emotion. And, and that must be the role of the defence lawyer. We should be unemotional about it. I mean, I, I remember, I have to tell you, in, 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 the, in, the, in the House of Lords, uh, when the CPS um, secured their victory in the first case, and good luck to them, and they've gone three, two up, I did see, because in front of me, the lawyer actually for the CPS show emotion as if how delighted he was. I'm sure he was, he was tired to be, but you don't show emotion. And, and that's what you have to do because it's that picture which they take just like, although broadly, uh, I didn't think I was under any great threat. And I knew the police were watching intelligence for me. And, and I got on very, very well with the police through it. We had to professionally. Um, I was well aware that uh, when I went into anywhere, and you would have seen it, some people, the um, the people protesting the Amnesty International, all these was entitled to do, and they if they move forward to you, as they often did, because there was never enough police officers to control them, that was a worry. I don't know what they would have, whether they had a knife or anything like that, but what I did know, if I showed any emotion whatsoever, even push one of them away, it's that picture the media will have. I suppose that's one of the pressures on it. Okay, normally we close it in an hour, but I think just for two or three minutes, I've just been asked, and uh, uh, amongst your very well-known clients uh, were the McCanns, and you've had to deal with them in, I think, two different ways. And perhaps you just quickly run through that what you had to do for uh, Dr. and Dr. McCann, yes? I mean, they're both doctors. Yeah, they? uh, um very sad position, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, it's two issues that they were um, uh, suspects out uh, in Portugal. And when they came back, remember, they came back on a Sunday, um, they were suspects, and, and I was instructed to, to go and see them. I've been instructed the week before, but I couldn't tell anyone uh, um, to go and see them. And um, twofold, really, it was to advise them about their position and also to see what we could do in assisting in finding Madeline. And one of the sadnesses of the case is that a long time had elapsed between that and it's pretty basic policing that you secure the scene, which sadly the Portuguese police hadn't done. I'd worked out very quickly. You could tell when she had been taken and that was on Crime Watch a year later, there was no secret about it. It simply could not have been them. There was not the time or the position. You could work it out from the statements. But in Portugal, they were suspects and a large part of the Portuguese public thought that they were the people that did it. Um, I think people in this country who thought that as well. But by and large, I was dealing with that and also with trying to help. Um, and they had engaged the media. And as I always say, if you turn the media on, you can't turn it off. Um, and... That, that was the position, but I do have to say uh, that on the first morning when I phoned, or well, I suppose it was Monday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, the control room at Leicestershire Police to say, look, I've been instructed, I want to work with you. Within 20 minutes, the chief constable himself had phoned me back, um, which was quite extraordinary. And I just tell one very quick story about the McCann, that they were very religious Roman Catholics, as you probably know, went to church every Sunday. And um, not an easy thing at the end of September, beginning of October, being in a high profile, quick running case where it's going on. And so I had to tell Jerry McCann at one stage, look, you know, I, I'm Jewish. I'm we're coming up to the Jewish New Year and I'm just simply going to be unavailable for various times. And I recall him telling me now he had got thousands and thousands of letters of support. But he said, 
we've had a very nice letter of support from the Jewish United Congregation in Leicester. And it had to be genuine because you would not have known of those names. And I really thought that was nice. Um, if anyone's interested in the case, Kate McCann has written a book about it. Um, in fact, she does uh, chronicle in that book our meetings. So there's nothing confidential about it. It's a very sad case. Let me, uh, one last question, and it's the same question I asked Jeremy last week, actually. Um, and here, you, let's hear your answer on it. Have you ever wanted, at the end of a case or a situation or whatever, you just needed somebody to talk it through with on an emotional or psychological level, just to offload from horrible things you'd seen, horrible things you'd heard, terrible outcomes of a case or whatever? Look, we're, we're, we're human. Everyone's human and you do get affected by things and the pressures in cases. There's no question about it. There are occasions when uh, I've really wanted to perhaps talk to people and the one person who's always done that is Jane, who's been marvellous throughout. Without her, I'm not just saying it, she's downstairs somewhere. Um, we wouldn't have got as far as I did. Um, but we, all, we must understand we're all human. Um, we all have emotions and there are occasions and I think when a pressurised case you do feel a bit but what I've always tried to do sometimes successfully sometimes not is to be try, try to be unemotional about it because I think if you become emotional then you can't give the service the professional service your resp professional responsibility to someone and I suppose am I any different in that as a defence lawyer any different to that to the surgeon whose duty whatever the person is whatever they may have they're done, not done. Um, are they in a different position? They have responsibility to do that, just like the defence lawyer. Michael Captain QC, football referee and sports <laughs> journalist, international uh, celebrity. It's been a fascinating hour. I know we could have gone on longer, but I just want to thank you very much indeed. And I wish everybody a very good evening. Next, we've got, of course, got Purim coming up. Um, we haven't asked anybody yet whether you would have defended Homan. Uh, <laughs> but there's a great Purim programme coming up with lots of things going on. Uh, next Sunday, Judge Martin Ziedman will be talking about the role of a judge in uh, criminal cases in the English courts. And the week after that, the youngsters of our community are actually going to do a script of a trial and you, the jury, will decide whether the accused is guilty or not. So... Good evening. Good night, everybody. Michael, thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. Very thank interesting. You. Amazing. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank Absolutely you. excellent. Bye-bye. Absolutely Michael. excellent, Michael. Absolutely.